Kaput. All views expressed in this podcast are the opinion of the host and in no way medical advice. Good morning, Tim. How are you doing? Good morning, Aaron. Slash good evening here. Uh, I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. It's a uh, bit of a frosty Sunday morning, I think, uh, in in Larn Town. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't remember that particular archway in Larn Town myself, but it's maybe it's a new brand thing. New, right. But it's 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 aged uh, very artistically. Yeah, <laughs> they, they brought technicians in. <laughs> to make it look authentic. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you really? I'm in uh, Western Japan in a prefecture called Fukui. Uh, so if you can imagine Dublin would be Tokyo, yep. then Fukui would be Galway, so the opposite side yes. of the country. Yeah. And I'm at an, a pretty old Shinto shrine, which is about 10 minutes from my house. And uh, it was actually started in the year 891. So wow. It gives you a bit of a... That's proper old. Perspective, yeah. And there are actually about 100... I was looking this up. There are about 100,000 of these all over Japan, public... Uh, shrines that you can go to at any time and there's um, there's rarely anybody here there were just two people coming down the stairs there and they in Japan everybody still wears a mask even though you're outside or alone in your car so that's why I have the the black and ninja mask on but when I start climbing the, those steps I'll be taking it off believe me yeah, when in Rome, mate, as they say. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> At this point, Aaron very kindly indulges my curiosity and gives us a tour of the shrine for about six minutes. I've moved this section to the end of the podcast, just in case you're listening to the audio only, or it's just not your thing. You're telling me there it's about four degrees, is that right? Yeah. And you're going to sit outside on a camping chair? For the benefit of this podcast, I think that's uh, a very honourable thing you're doing. I wouldn't do it for anybody else. Oh, Just remember that. I, I will remember that. <laughs> I remember it when he sent me the bill as well, probably. <laughs> okay, so the GoPro's on now. I think that would be a nice segue into just explaining to people how we know each other, which is, of course... We studied together photography, isn't that right? That's it. I think it was 2014. Would that be right? Yep. We started at the University of Ulster, as it was called. But, um, I think it's changed now to Ulster University. That's right. So it still manages but, to keep its acronym the same. It does. You, you. But, um, so literally, I think our transcript, you know, your certificate you get at the end when you graduate, I think ours was the last to say the University of Ulster. So <laughs> you could say that it's literally not even worth the paper it's printed <laughs> on because I have not exist thought that anymore. before. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that really depressing thought. <laughs> <laughs> while, while you're still paying off your student loan, just think about that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I think um, that course was one of, I've been lucky enough to experience it on one other occasion in an education setting as well, actually, where the yeah. whole class just really gelled kind of immediately from day one. Um, and I think it's, a, it's just nice to, uh, nod, tip the cap to that because that is rare and really awesome when that happens. We were lucky, yeah, and there was um, uh, there was a real mix of age ranges too. There were yeah people, you know, I think there were people still in their twenties. This was a MFA, might I add, a master's <laughs> of course. Yes. Well, we need to clarify to emphasize that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But there were some really good kind. Um, driven 
and creative people there. So yeah, I mean, I look back on it as some of the best years of school, really, education Definitely. that I've had. I think as well, whenever you, because um, for me, that that MFA, I got, I took a loan to do it, but it was, you know, it's not one of these bullshit student loans, wink, wink, that you never pay back. It was, you know, yeah, it's a loan that they give you something like 18 months and then you just, you're paying it. But I think you're there's something it, yeah. beneficial in that when you, you're actually investing real money, you really aim to get the most from it you know absolutely and it's not like high school where you have to go it's you've yeah. specifically chosen to do that course and um so you, hopefully everybody wants to be there at the, at the start and yeah it doesn't feel like a chore you know you're 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 raring to go every time yeah. you want to go in and uh get you know get fed to the wolves put it that way <laughs> i mean yeah the other thing that i think i i forget myself one of the other huge privileges we had in that course was to have some legit world-class tutors i don't think that's an over exaggeration at all no they were very well known in their field of expertise and yeah it was a little bit intimidating but also whenever you know they they did kind of respond to something that you made created then it gave you a bit of an extra boost because you knew that you trusted that they were they knew what they were talking about they were experts in their field so very much so yeah. but yeah those those were those were good times um i learned a lot i think but yeah um Speaking of which, you have a YouTube channel, don't you? I do, yeah. And, and what's that all about? Uh, mainly because of the whole last two years I started it. It's uh -huh. called Relaxing Videos from Japan. Okay. And you can get there just by YouTube and then the forward slash, type that in. Um, okay. But it's real you'll see when it, uh, if you do visit it it's uh hopefully what it says it is the some of the landscapes here are pretty unique and i would like just go there and there'd be no people around mainly because of you know the last two years or so and just set yeah. up a camera and not move the camera but let the landscape move let the scenery move and uh record it for an hour or maybe loop it for eight hours because i didn't realize this but there's a lot of people that will put that on now that you can have youtube on your tv and they'll fall asleep to it mm. so i thought well you know i'm in a pretty unique position to be able to do it here in uh in Fukui. Mm -hmm. So I started that round about the time that everything uh, went bad. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, yeah, I would obviously highly recommend that people go have a look because the stuff is really stunning and it's so relaxing, as you say. I could imagine people falling asleep to it, definitely. Um, I didn't realize there was this whole thing. And thank you, by the way. Um, of course. ASMR. I didn't know what that was about <laughs> or what it stood stood for. Yeah. And uh, I actually can't remember what that what the acronym. I can't. I can't either right now. I know. Something to do with you know, tuning out white noise, relaxing, etc. Do you want me to Google uh, it? I yeah. We. I don't have access. There's. Here there's, we go. You're, are you ready? Engine. I go for it. Autonomous sensor. Oh, I can't even say it. Autonomous sensory meridian response. There you go. Oh wow! I thought the R was for relax. No, <laughs> I got that, I got that, I got that wrong. That's the culty version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
the Lauren version. Um, Our sofa movie. <laughs> relax. Uh, class. <laughs> but yeah, you, you've you've signed in your videos, don't you? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, that adds a huge extra element. Yeah. I think so, especially when just when we're sitting here. I don't know what you can hear, but there's apart from the odd distant terrain there's not really anything but then if you actually stop and really listen there's a lot more you know i can hear the the little water fountain that we saw earlier i can hear a little bit of wind i can hear some of the leaves and uh yeah it's uh, i suppose it's an exercise in mindfulness isn't it just to yeah stop and listen to the noise for sure i know the last time that we spoke i could hear birds a few little birds that was it yeah there were a load of big uh massive crows earlier but they've they've disappeared yeah. i don't know where they've gone but everything here is uh everything here is sacred in uh shintoism so that's why they're often uh built or constructed in the forest or on a mountain is because what little i know about that religion is that it's all about um kami or supernatural entities that are in everything that are in a rock or a tree or an animal mm. um Oh yeah, there, there's, there's a, a wee bird. Yeah, that. yeah. So it's it's a great place to come and relax. And but I don't really come here and sit down. I I would come to places like this with a camera because they're for me they're very photogenic. Yeah. So I come sure. here and focus. I suppose the word yeah. is I wouldn't come here and relax. I would focus, but in the process of taking photographs um yeah you you enter somewhat of a meditative state which not a bad thing yeah i thoroughly agree um and obviously in with regards to mental health which is what this podcast is of course all about i know i have experienced huge benefit from doing very similar things obviously not in japan yet but yeah in a lot of different places and especially in in nature you know whether that's landscapes or nature photography you know animals birds etc yeah just you're spot on there's something there that's um it's the focus that it takes and then that combined with um just the serenity and the peace and the calm um yeah i think i always recommend anyone go have a go at it because it's just for me it's it's hard to beat absolutely and and when you think about why that is why most people like to go out and be close to nature or go for a walk or go to the beach i think it's because uh we're we're kind of living out of whack at the moment. Um, yes. We're really not paying attention to ourselves and what works well for the, a human being. You know, and in school, you're taught how to look after your physical body, but you're never, you're not really, at least I wasn't taught about how to look after your. Uh, mental well-being mm -hmm. and getting back to nature seems to be something that human beings uh maybe it's you know it's it's one of those ancient aspects of of being who we are is that we gravitate towards where we originated you know in the in the not in a concrete apartment building but we yeah. originated you know 
in the landscape, forests, you know, surrounded by nature. And that's yeah. why I think it really works for a lot of people. Kind of takes you back to your mm. origins and uh, just the simplicity of it. You feel more connected, maybe the word is. Yeah, I, I'd actually, I hadn't thought of it that way before. And that's really interesting. It's a bit like, um, you know, when you when you go look at an open fire or a bonfire or a whatever, mm. a fire pit, there's something really entrancing about it. And I've heard people say something similar. It's that it taps into some primal thing where you, you know, you knew fire was was warmth and safety and light and heat and all these incredibly important things and we're just not that far evolutionarily away from that state still clearly in our brain because we just go wow and we just get hypnotized by it and uh yeah i think you're i think you're probably spot on there's something similar in being out in nature definitely yeah i think we've come we've come too far too fast and our Yes, our I agree. brains are still still trying to catch up. So, yes. yeah, I think we still need. I think we still need that connection. I agree. I think it's it's a whole other topic, probably. But um, yeah, the the thing that we're doing with technology, um, you know, technology is wonderful, and it helps. I mean, look at what we're doing right now. This would be the biggest hypocritical moment ever if I was to slander technology. I'm having a um, you're in a in a shrine in the west coast of Japan. I'm sitting in um, Belfastish at half midnight on a Saturday night, and we have zero lag between this phone call, Zoom call, and that is just incredible. But on the flip side of that, it's like um, we often talk about balance. Everything's balance. And yeah, I think we have um, we've raced ahead too far uh, and people are suffering. People's mental health in particular is suffering as a result. Things like social media, etc. cetera. Um, but like I say, it's kind of a whole other topic. It is, but it, it, it definitely raises mental health. Yeah, you have to too you know too much of too much technology too much screen time not enough uh being outside and uh the exercise and going for a walk yeah it's definitely part of the problem definitely because obviously i think we all know this but we forget because we get swept up in in zoom calls and work and sitting at desks, but of course, mental and physical health are very much linked, you know, like if you have a healthy mental, um, no, let me put that the other way. If you have a healthy physical body, chances are your mental health is going to match that and vice versa. So yeah, you're, you're spot on. We need to be getting out. We need to be moving our bodies around. I think it works for me anyway. It does work for me, but I used to resist it for so long. But and uh, <laughs> I would listen to people, and there were people on TV, you know, with the six pack, and they'd be so healthy, and they'd be raving about the gym and avocados, and you know, a really healthy <laughs> lifestyle. And it just really, yeah. it just put me off. I just thought it was a load of rubbish. But then, when I started to really suffer um, with my mental health. I, I think it was a friend of mine said to me, look, it's really, it's it's difficult to be anxious or uh, caught up in your own thoughts when you're kind of, you know, knocking your pan in at the gym. So mm. that's what I started to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and go a couple of times a week and just uh, run. I won't do anything else. Also because I'm trying to lose all the, the, the pandemic weight yeah. but yeah when you're when i'm on the mm -hmm. treadmill and i'm you know pushing myself that's you don't worry about anything else you just want to get that timer to zero so you can get off it yes <laughs> the harder you no. work the quicker the uh the suffering is over <laughs> yeah. yeah 
very primeval, but yeah, no. Yeah, it, it um, one thing I, I, well, I, I don't say this to a lot of people, to be fair, because it just depends on your circumstances, but people who have the right circumstances, I say, get a dog. If you can, yeah. if at all possible, get a dog, because then you have a very energetic excuse that will not let you forget to go outside every single day. That's so, it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not up to you. It's up to the dog. That's We're right. going out. And if you don't do it, your life is going to be miserable because that dog's going to remind you <laughs> that it has much more energy than you, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's also that connection that you have with them. And uh, I don't know much Japanese, even after three and a half years, but I know some of the Chinese characters and the character for a person is very similar to the same character for a dog. There's only one ah, small difference. That's so, interesting. Yeah, I don't know why that is, but there's, you know, man's best friend, all that. Mm -hmm. But I should clarify that I'm actually a cat person, Tim. Oh. But uh, <laughs> I knew there was so I knew there was something wrong. I was being very polite, and I thought, "No, I have to stand up for cats here because cats get <laughs> cats get a lot of bad publicity." Um, but yeah, it depends how you. I think you can be both. You know, my sister had a dog, and I loved taking it for a walk. But mm -hmm. I also loved when my cat would just stand and kind of give me a really condescending look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, before it took itself for a walk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Of course, I think you can be both. Um, I'm totally not, though. I'm a massive just screw cats, like screw cats. <laughs> I've had bad experiences. <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Of course. Yeah. No, I, I I love cats in the. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, they're just the opposite of dogs in that way. Like you just said, it's literally like, no, don't you tell me what to do. I'll tell you what to do. I'm going to, I'm going out for my walk now and my food better yeah. be here. At, you know what I mean? So now nah, they're, they're great fun. They're very self-sufficient. Yes. Uh, yeah. But I didn't realize this until relatively recently. They'll, they'll gulp down a whole bowl of uh, milk, you know, cow's milk, mm -hmm. but it's actually not very good for them. Right. Um, but uh, they won't stop, you know, <laughs> they just can't get enough of it. So, yeah, yeah, a bit like a dog in that regard, and that some of them could eat and eat and eat, you know. Yeah, my dog's like that. There's, she's only 11 kilos, but I swear she could eat 11 kilos of food if you just give her it, you know. Yeah, she just wouldn't stop. <clears throat> um, but yeah, you so. You just mentioned there you've been in Japan three and a half years. Do you want to tell everyone what on earth are you doing in Japan and why have you been there for three and a half years? Uh, I ask myself that frequently. <laughs> um, well, I think so. Back to when we met each other at university, that course finished, two-year course in 2016. Yep. And... A few months later, um, one day my mother turned yellow. Her skin turned yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, full-on Simpsons character, uh, mm -hmm. which initially was funny, but you can your skin can turn yellow for a relatively harmless reason, yeah. or you know, or you're in a deep shit. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be the latter, unfortunately for her. So yeah. she had developed pancreatic cancer. And it was one of the early signs of that, or too late sign, is that uh, you, it blocks your bile duct and you have that buildup, which uh, leads to the pigmentation of your skin changing. Okay. So within ah, within about five months of that happening, uh, she passed away. It was so 
quick. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, it didn't feel quick, if you know what I mean. I'm sure it didn't. And, and, yeah. You know, I, I, could, I could slowly, I was living with her, I was caring for her. I could see her slowly deteriorate, even though she fought it as best she could, you know, chemotherapy and everything. But yeah, I knew at the time when the doctor called us to the hospital and told us that's what it was. I just thought about Patrick Swayze and it might sound strange, but I was a fan of Patrick Swayze and he got pancreatic cancer and he died from it. And I thought, you know, if Patrick Swayze can't beat pancreatic cancer, because I remember him in his films, he was always so strong and energetic and physical. Yeah. Um, I thought, how's my 68 year old mother who smoked for almost 50 years, who has other health problems and diabetes, how's she going to beat this? So, yeah. I kind of, from that day when the doctor calls you to the hospital and gives you the news, I thought I wasn't very hopeful because also I knew that it's a, it's a, it's a relatively bad one to get. You know, if you're going to get cancer, you don't, it's one of the ones that you don't want to get. Yeah. So after she passed away, I was kind of lost. I was very much lost. Mm -hmm. I'd already, you might hear that tree in there passing. I'd already lost my father 30 years before he died mm -hmm. from cancer when he was, I think he was 38 at the time, or 39. Okay. So mm -hmm. I became a uh, parentless or became an orphan. I thought, what am I going to do now? I'm living in this family home but there's nobody really in it. It feels more like a museum mm. than a home. And it was full of 90% or 95% really good memories. But the last few months of, you know, my mother's illness were grueling, were pretty difficult to get through. So first of all, I did uh, a road trip. I just got out of the house and I drove uh, to Italy from County Antrim. I planned it all out, of course. I didn't. I didn't just didn't get into the car and go. Yeah. And uh, that really helped me clear my head yeah. and just process uh, the last five six months. Mm -hmm. And then I came back from that and I thought, right, I'm back here again. Um, I haven't really improved the situation. So I've been aware of uh, a teaching program in Japan for mm -hmm. a few years. Uh, so I applied for that. And I was there the following summer I arrived. Is that 17? Um, or it, that would 18? be, she passed away in 17. So I was there the following summer. Okay. It's quite a long process the application process so i had to wait okay uh, so that was probably a, the biggest factor wanting to get away also uh new people that had come here and they said good things and i'd wanted to live i'd lived in i'd lived abroad before but i hadn't lived in a country where english wasn't the first language so i thought well that might be a interesting challenge hmm and yeah, they were, they were probably, they're the reasons why. Oh, and also I should say, because I wanted to teach English. Um, yeah. I was just going to say that. I assume, I assume you're teaching English. Obviously, I, am, I, I know you are, but uh, sorry, the viewers will assume you're teaching English or the listeners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm at a high school, so they're, all between 16, 15, 16, 17, 18. They're okay. there for three years. The system's a bit different mm -hmm. to back home. It's probably 90% boys. Right. Because it's a, it's like a technical high school school. So a lot of them will go on to do 
technical jobs, which in Japan at least attracts is more attractive to boys it seems than girls. There are a few girls. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's the story of how I got here. But I didn't I didn't I didn't choose this part of Japan. Right. Yeah. I wanted to go to Kyoto because a lot of people know Kyoto. Um, mm -hmm. Very beautiful, lots of temples. It's an old city. It's one of the, I think it's one of the few to survive the Second World War intact. I think that's because a general in the American army had a connection to the place. Maybe he had his honeymoon there. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's right. largely intact. So I wanted to go there. Mm -hmm. Then there was another city. Um, Osaka, big city. Yeah. And I think the third place was not in Tokyo, but near to Tokyo. And I got neither. I got, uh, the, I remember the letter arrived to say, Congratulations, you're heading to Fukui. <laughs> <laughs> you're going, What the and hell I'd is never, Fukui? I'd never heard of the place. And when I was uh, Googled it, it said it was second from bottom of visited places so right okay like uh, but you don't you don't have a choice you either say yes or no or i'm not going to go okay um and incidentally the way it's spelt is f u k u i so <laughs> when you read that on the top of the letter you know <laughs> i see what you're saying bit of a yeah but no, I can't complain at all because it's a, uh, you have places like this and it's small population. You can get in the car and drive into the mountains, the forest. You'll see deer, antelope, uh, wild boar. There, you see the odd warning sign for bear, but um, no, there isn't one creeping up on me as we speak. <laughs> bear really so, yeah what kind of bears are they i think they're a black bear right uh the word uh, is kuma in japanese I think. are they the bigger brown what's this bigger between brown and black i always forget i'm not sure and i always get this confused because i yeah. think i read one of them you're if you say it you're supposed to not move and yes. the other kind you're supposed to run so yes <laughs> You got to get that right at the at a critical moment. Yes, you do. You should probably you should probably learn that bit. <laughs> but no, I haven't seen I haven't seen any. Um, but it's like it's you know the more that human beings encroach upon their the natural habitat, the more uh, you come into contact with them. So they're often caught and. If there's nowhere to release them, then they're then they're disposed of, you know, because they can attack people. Yeah, I think the only place I've been, I think ever, was California, um, sort of in the sticks, you know, Yosemite direction, where yeah, they had bear signs everywhere, and I think they told me, you know, if you see them in the areas near people, just make a lot of noise and shout at them basically mm. and it's just that whole association you want them to associate people with noise so they don't like you oh, so that's they it. hopefully don't come back but I, I guess no where you're sitting right now you know if a bear came crawling out you'd, you'd say well you're kind of more in his house than he's in yours almost from the looks of it that's at least it. <laughs> yeah i know so it would serve me right it's like people sort of. you know swimming in shark infested waters and then they're yep. shocked and surprised when <laughs> something bad happens <laughs> yeah i know um you were saying there so you went to italy initially after your mum passed mm. um and then after that you were interested in this teaching experience in japan do you think there's mm -hmm. something because this is something i want to do an episode on in the future um which I've, I've started sort of doing notes and research on but do you think there's something in travel that's 
you know, well, a lot of things, A, beneficial for mental health and B, just kind of intrinsically kind of intriguing and interesting because it, it is for me at least. Definitely. Um, I think it also depends on where you go. Yeah. For me, I don't really like going to big cities anymore. And uh, when I was teenager or in my 20s that would attract me but now I prefer uh, somewhere outside less people less noise and I don't yeah. know why that change has happened but definitely because it takes you into a whole new environment and it's a break it's a definite break it's a physical break it's a mental break I think that's why people enjoy looking forward to their holidays every year because they can for a moment forget about their daily grind and just do whatever they want for a week or two weeks or yeah. however long it is so it's for me it's a very liberating experience and also it's stimulating because everything's new and exciting and uh, maybe you've read up about this place that you want to visit and then the journey to get there, the anticipation, you finally see it mm -hmm. and with your own eyes. There's something magical about that. And yeah. then also if you enjoy taking photographs, you can, oh, you can yeah. do that too. That's a very good point. That's probably a huge, huge part of it for me. I am. Um, I was listening to a really good podcast the other day. Jimmy Carr was on Jordan Peterson's podcast oh, and right. they were talking about travel. Um, and he was saying, I think it was Jimmy Carr was making the point that you, especially when you're young, you get to kind of try on different personalities when you travel, which kind of ah. is useful because, you know, you get to realize the good ones and the bad ones. And just, you know, it's, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, yeah. When you're still kind of working yourself out, you get to go, well, no one knows me here. So. I'll try and be a bit more whatever and just see what happens. And then you get to take that and information back home and either implement it or, or not in your normal life, which I thought was cool. Mm. It also broadens your horizons. You know, that word, that expression, but yeah, um, it's I true. Especially, especially for nothing against, you know, our, home our homeland but it sometimes it can feel very uh small yeah it is you know it is a small country but it can the the environment can also feel very small and i think to get a, a opportunity to to get outside of that see different things hear different languages try different foods yeah i think um perspective as well it's amazing for perspective mm. especially if you go to places that maybe you don't have as much um what would you call it just sort of financial freedom in the population you know yeah um they have christmas in japan of course uh, they mm -hmm. have the tree and the reindeer and santa claus yeah and they have the presents and they have the snow and they have the lights but there's one character who is missing from that story mm -hmm. i don't know if you can guess who that might be a biblical man he is yes <sighs> you're getting very very warm he is nowhere <laughs> to be seen <laughs> right on all all the uh, the idea of Christmas here. Yeah. So for me, that's really interesting. Um, they had take every aspect about that, except for, you know, the, the Christian aspect, because they're not a Christian country. And it's yeah. so um, strange mm -hmm. to live in a country that's not a Christian country because the first yes. time I've ever done that in my life. Yeah. 
and uh, I'm not a religious person uh, at all. I consider myself an atheist. So for me, that's also another beneficial aspect to getting away from where, where we grew up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's you can interesting. See, you can see how things are different and the culture is different and they don't need that certain aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. You just reminded me of something when you're talking about Christmas. This is really random, but I heard recently that is it Japan that KFC is very popular for Christmas? Oh, yeah. Is yeah, that one of the best that's... marketing scams you've ever heard in your life or what? <laughs> I don't know why that is. Well, why? Maybe it's because they think that everybody in the West eats chicken or turkey, you know, on that day. So yeah. let's go to the chicken restaurant, which, you know, the Western chicken restaurant is KFC. Yep. Uh, here, there's, I think that's the only one they don't have. Nando's or another place you can get fried chicken. So yeah, it seems to be a thing, and it's quite funny to for for us to see that and not, you know, because if you did that on Christmas Day at home, you you brought back you know a big bargain bucket for everyone as a <laughs> Christmas lunch. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be told you'd be told where to go. You'd be ostracized, I think, from most families. Yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. It's a, it's a little bit like you know, um, like Foster's Lager. You know, the whole angle is it's like Australian. It's pure Australian. Right. You know what I mean? It's like apostrophe mm -hmm. s Australian. And um, if you go to Australia, you can't find it anywhere. It just isn't just isn't the thing. I mean, it is a thing. I mean, I was there for three months. I saw it in one bar once. But uh, yeah, it's just marketing. Marketing is amazing. Absolutely, yeah. I, you're right. I've been to Australia and I don't remember seeing it anywhere. Yeah. Maybe Victoria Bitter or something else that was horrendous, but yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what the main one was. Was it Victoria? Yeah, it's been a while. It was like flipping 11 or 12 years ago, that for me. I can't, uh, I can't drink beer anymore. I've recently been diagnosed with celiac disease. Oh, really? Yeah, and I think that was also led into my, you know, mental health deteriorating because my, I was off, I often felt sick, often felt nausea, had stomach problems. So I just felt generally unwell and it was really getting me down. I couldn't, I suspected that's what it was, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, um, it's incredibly rare in Japan. I don't know why that is, whether it's just because of their DNA or, or, or maybe they're just not as aware of it. That's very interesting that you say that. Um, I've literally just been having that conversation with a couple of different people recently. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, yeah, I think I'm going to try cutting out gluten myself just to see what happens. Well, I would recommend before you do that, if you do think you have it, you should go for a test first because the test relies on one of the tests, the most common test relies on an antibody that your body produces when you eat gluten. So I had been avoiding it for a few years. So when I went, got tested, came up negative because my body wasn't making that antibody. So uh... the doctor at the time thought, oh, you don't have it. I see. You know, you don't have it because we can't we can't find the antibody. But it was only recently when I went back. There's a more accurate test that looks at your the DNA from your parents, and if it has right. a specific uh, marker, then also together with your symptoms, that's how they could diagnose me. But I don't know if you've ever had a a camera down the throat, you know, into your stomach before. No, I haven't. That I had that about a month ago, and uh, 
I don't know if we're getting off topic or not, but um, <laughs> it's, it's quite all right. I went to the doctor at the hospital and he said, you know, I hear that most people in the West, they, they need sedation for this. So you're a bit like gas and air at the dentist. You know, you're awake, but you're kind of half out of it. Mm -hmm. And then, and, but he said, oh, you know, in Japan, we don't, we don't need it. Oh, no. So I thought, okay, all right. I don't well, like where this is going, man. You're very, <laughs> you're very strong Japanese. So then he made me sign a piece of paper that said, if I did want the sedation, I would have 0.000024% chance of dying. So I signed it just in case I needed it. Mm -hmm. And I said, right, I'll see you for the appointment. So the day came for the appointment and there was a Japanese man waiting, uh, in front of me and he walked in for his procedure and about 15 or 20 minutes later I saw a nurse bring a wheelchair to the same room that he went into and he, so basically oh, no. he walked in and he was wheeled out with the sedative drip inside his arm and I remember the doctor telling me oh you know the Japanese people they don't really need sedation for this. And I thought, you know, I'm about to walk in here. <laughs> what am I walking into? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a very, talk about trying to control your anxiety mm -hmm. um, without sedation. It was a real challenge because if you, you can imagine if, if you have the endoscope, you know, in your stomach and you yep. freak out, you have a panic Oof. attack. Oof. It can be really, it can be horrendous. You know, I think that obviously the doctor is quite quick at whipping him out. Yeah. You know, so I lay down there on my left side and uh, she showed me the endoscope and I had pictured, I thought, oh, you know, Japan's very advanced and uh, it'll be tiny. She held up this thing that was like a black garden hose <laughs> and, you know, with the flashing lights and waved it at me. And I, and I oh, thought, no. holy shit, this thing, I'm going to have, this thing is going down my gub and uh, I don't have any sedation. I have a gel that, num that numbed um, the back of my throat. That's it. Wow. And uh, so the... The hardest part is that initial U bend, you know, where you effectively swallow it. And then yeah. after that, you can somewhat relax and watch it on the TV. You know, you can journey through your system. Yeah. Wow. And uh, the whole time I was remembering my breathing techniques mm -hmm. uh, because I wanted to stay calm. I didn't want to freak out. Yeah. But I was a nervous wreck. Mm -hmm. And then as part of the procedure, they had to take four biopsies, you know, little samples of my upper uh, intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So you can see it on the TV. So she took this thin metal wire and quickly feeds it down the garden hose while it's inside you. And then on the TV screen, you suddenly this little metal crocodile appears just quietly sitting there in the corner of the screen. And you know it's going to go straight into your duodenum and take a chomp and then get pulled out. You know, right. it was it's something that I'll never forget. So she did that four times. Um, the whole thing lasted about 15, 20 minutes. But that, mate, was a real exercise in mind over matter. Mm. And, uh I'm sorry, was that linked to the celiac um, diagnosis? Yeah, that was that was right, the, right, right, right. Yeah, that was all part of the detection. I think they also wanted to rule out, you know, anything more sinister. Yeah, fair enough. But yeah, I mean, it was um, it was a very challenging thing that I went through. But afterwards, I felt so strong. Yes, for having gone through it, being an I consider myself an anxious person. Yeah. Um, and also because, you know, the Japanese patient before me required 
sedation, but I yeah. managed to get through it, you know, without. That so, doesn't help to see someone else. No. And because being a foreigner here, you do feel um, not second class, but you do feel insecure. Yeah. I can Especially imagine. if you don't speak the language very well you do feel insecure so that moment that was a small victory for me yeah you know you've reminded me this is you're gonna laugh at this comparison i'm gonna draw here excuse me one second <clears throat> but um something i've always wanted to do my entire life is scuba diving mm. um and i finally did it in in corfu that i mentioned earlier with all the monasteries right. um and it was oddly similar to the way you described that experience. Because I wouldn't describe myself as anxious, but maybe that's just because I didn't know what anxious was. Um, my stuff more so has been depression, but I just thought, I don't know, there's something about being deep down under the water and, you know, you've got this oxygen tank and that's it. You cannot mess it up. That's a mm. wee bit terrifying. And anyway, long story short, I finally did it um, and just nailed it. You know, we were underwater solid for about 35, 40 minutes, like a good long wow. time, crawling around on the ground. Um, and it was really murky, you know. It was like, mm. it, was, it was a lot of uh, strong tide that day. So it wasn't ideal to, to sort of see fish. We saw a few but in theory, it was bad. But in practice, it was kind of a bit like if you ever get stuck up, a, not stuck up a mountain, but you go up a mountain and there's fog and you kind of enter this strange hypnotic state where it's not, you're not a mountain anymore. You're kind of in like a dreamscape. Right. That doesn't sound too trippy. Um, and basically then whenever I eventually, they were like, okay, that's it. Pop back up to the surface. It was like re-entering life in 4K. Because suddenly it went from being used to this murky, weird <sighs> noise and no vision to just bright sunshine, blue sky, just, um, but no, I, I honestly just with the way you described a sense of achievement of, of just being able to mind over matter. That was very much a similar experience for me, not to make light of you getting chunks taken out of your, uh, stomach. But also, if, if you know, you're, I wasn't really risking death during my um, experience, but if something had gone wrong or you had freaked out, you know, it could have been a lot worse for you. So the stakes, the stakes were a bit higher, I would say, even though you're on a fun tourist day out. But yeah, yeah, so it was great. I would say. I would celebrate, recommend it. Yes, celebrate yeah. those small victories, definitely. Yes, it's something I've been really um, trying to do, trying to be more intentional about, is um, is celebrating. I notice it's something I've never been very good at, even birthdays, Christmas, all that stuff. I just couldn't care less. And now I'm like, take the opportunity to just... You know, meet up with people, give people gifts they don't need. Sure, why not? Mm. It makes them happy, and then you can be happy. Nothing in it. Not silly gifts, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be extravagant, yeah. but it's just the thought. So, yeah, I'm with you. Celebrating is important, I think. I was listening to someone talk recently on a podcast, and they were saying about it's how you react to situations. You know, you can, you have a choice how to react. Mm. And uh, when you just when you talk about birthdays there, um, somebody I think I was complaining about my get my birthday getting older, and somebody said to me, somebody reminded me that there are a lot of people that don't make it to the age that you're at, mm. and uh, it just changed my whole way of looking at it. Yeah, and that you know, it's it. I felt very selfish for complaining uh, yep. because oh, I lived for another year when there's, <laughs> you know, there's many people that don't make it to that. And so that's perspective again, isn't it really? Yeah. Sometime yeah. after I was 
uh, in a previous job and someone came in, came in and it was their birthday, but they weren't very happy. Yeah. And they were complaining, you know, very similar to what I was doing. So I had the chance to tell them what I've just told you. And you could see, you know, their expression change and say, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. Mm. Um, but you're right. So if you can somehow make the choice of how you react to things in life, I think that's a real gift Yeah, that I've yet to master. But in, in terms of birthdays, also because, um, you know, my father passed away in his late thirties. So now I'm older than he ever was, mm. which is a real strange thought. That is a strange thought. Um, and you're currently 40. Currently 41. Yeah. 41. Um, yeah. So perspective is amazing. Giving you a perspective, which helps you react in a positive way. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I learned from someone telling me that about don't be sad on your birthday. You know, I like that. I like that a lot. How are you doing for uh, temperature, mate? You don't look roasting, I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there's a few rays of sunshine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is a very popular snack in Japan. I'll hold it up. I don't know if you can see. I've already eaten two out of the three. Okay. Um, Okay. And it's called dango. It's made from rice. So okay for celiac sufferers. Um, Is that on a little stick? So it's on a little stick. So I'll hold it up to that camera. And then you can, can you still see me on this? Yep. So I see three balls. One is green, one is yellow, one is pinkish. Or not yellow, white, yep. sorry. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. So it's made from uh, cooked rice, steamed, and then it's mashed right. and rolled into a ball. And then I think it's boiled. There's a bit of sugar in it. Um, okay. But it's only about 70p, maybe. maybe. It's about 100 yen. So okay. I'm just going to get my sugar level up right now and eat the pink one at the top. Go right ahead. To my mind, that sounds like a very weird combination, but obviously I have never tried it. But rice and like sugary thing together. But it's hard to describe. It tastes um, a bit like a thick mm, jelly. Maybe the inside of a Milky Way, okay. if you can think about that. Yep. But a bit. Um, a bit more chewy. Okay. Well, that sounds um, good. I'm interested now. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming back to life, mate, with one dango. Dango? Um, Is that how you say it? Dango. Dango, that's the name of it, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, obviously, that's one of many... Um, stark cultural differences i'm sure that you have experienced while you're there food you also you already mentioned language which is i suppose an obvious one but yeah what's what's the food difference like the food is there's a lot of seafood and i don't really like seafood you know at home i would happily have uh cod and chips no problem yeah. But here they will eat everything in the ocean, you know. Yeah. I've heard that uh, if kids, you know, they're maybe they're at a pond and they see fish, mm -hmm. it's not unusual for one of them to say oh, delicious, you know, but they'll use the Japanese word for it. Yeah. Interesting. So the food's very different. Um, 
there's a lot of rice, yeah. obviously. But they also they have to import nearly everything else. Uh, so the rice is probably the only Japanese food. Everything else, and the fish that they catch. Uh, but a lot of the salmon is from Norway. Uh, a lot of the soybeans are from America. I only know this because, uh, you know, there's a chapter in the student's textbook about this, about food miles. Yeah. So the food takes you a while to get used to. Um, for example, it's uh, every it's graduation time now for the students. So a lot of the uh, teachers will celebrate by having a, a lunch, but it'll be a, a box lunch, but a very fancy, you know, if you can imagine an ornate uh, decorative box, you know, that, that you, it's carefully wrapped and opened and it's all in the divided into sections. Is that like a bento box? A bento box, exactly. That's it. Okay. I'll, I'll stick a picture up for people because they, you're watching because they're they're really pretty they are and the you know the level of art that's put into something that just gets swallowed yeah right <laughs> is, no is amazing you know it's perishable yeah. so there's a there was this, in this bento that i had recently there was a, a a seafood section there were two rice sections there was an orange quadrant and then mm -hmm. there were what looked like caramelized walnuts, but they had these little red things, which I thought were like um, something spicy, but each one of them had a pair of eyes. <laughs> so, right. the, yeah, the food is, uh, the food takes a bit of getting used to. It's very different to, of course they have. KFC, McDonald's, sure, um, Pizza Hut, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is uh, ramen. If you like ramen, um, I do sushi like ramen. restaurants are very mm -hmm. popular and very cheap. And uh, very cheap. That's interesting because it's, it's ludicrously expensive at home, as you, you oh, probably right. know. Yeah. Um, no, here you just go and get a table and there'll be a touch screen order yeah. the food comes on the conveyor belt stops at your table and it's very cheap here but you can go to the more expensive sushi chain if you wish but i think i remember seeing somewhere in england in some fancy i can't remember the name of the fancy department store but they had a sushi restaurant and it, the prices were up there like I think because it's it's uh, niche somewhat there. Yeah, and maybe maybe some of the locations aren't you know obviously Japan is surrounded by an ocean and maybe that helps you know with the import costs of fish and so forth. And that's their main their main uh, food supply comes from the ocean. Yeah, because yeah, it's uh, relatively mountainous, which I didn't expect so there's not a whole lot of pasture i suppose you know if you picture if you picture northern ireland yeah in ireland the green fields you don't really i don't think i've seen a field of grass actually now that i think about it i don't think i've seen a field of grass wow yeah it'll all be divided into rice paddies yeah the flat the flat areas it'll either be wheat or rice yeah Hmm. And uh, I haven't. The only time I saw a cow outside was up in Hokkaido, in the very north uh, island of Japan. And right. I haven't seen one since. And it's so strange. I come because I come from quite a rural, somewhat rural part of Northern Ireland, where you can hear the cows, you know. And yeah. Just to not. Just to not see one for years feels very strange. Yeah. Where are they all being kept, you know?
I am still I'm still eating hamburgers and I'm still buying minced beef, but I don't know where the cows are. <laughs> Maybe they're flying they're flying them in from uh, where did you say America or somewhere? Aye. <clears throat> so yeah, yeah, that that's another thing to adapt to. Food, mm. Definitely. So obviously, the whole point of this um, is to you know discuss mental health related issues. So is there anything in particular culturally that you have found challenging specifically for your own mental health, would you say? I'd say definitely yes. In terms of the workplace, uh, I think they're known for working long hours. Yes. In my school, when I arrive, the teachers are there. And when I leave, they're still there, so I don't know what, what time they get to work or what time they leave work. And I leave on time, if not a little bit after, you know, to kind of express some solidarity. So there, that uh, stereotype about them working long hours, in my experience, is true, which can't be good for their mental health. Yeah. Like the work-life balance thing? I know in the office there's one um, sheet on the notice board and it says something about mental care and there's a telephone number. Right. But I don't know if it's ever used. Okay. Um, in terms of my own experience, last year I had, uh, during the height of the pandemic, mm -hmm. And this was before you could get a vaccine here. I had a panic attack. I was in a restaurant. And uh, it was the first time that I'd ever experienced that before. And it was pretty horrendous. Um, so after that, I went to the doctor and explained what had happened. And he seemed a bit... Uh, reluctant, you know, I didn't think he was going to do anything until I mentioned that it was affecting my work. Right. And then that seemed to, uh, in his mind, think, oh, okay, your work is suffering. So, right, I'll prescribe you some medication to help wow. prevent the, the panic attack. And then as I was leaving the doctors he said oh now you can work very hard <laughs> he, spoke a he spoke a little bit of english wow so he's almost more concerned about your job suffering than you aaron suffering it seemed that way i could mm. be misinterpreting it but it seemed that way okay um, yeah. i mean i still think it is taboo here um, yeah, it's still taboo in it, a lot of places, you know. Yeah. But I can and, imagine it's maybe even more so where you are. Yeah, if you can't perform at your best here or give your best, you know, they always tell the kids, uh, gambate, which is do your best. That's You hear that mm. so many times a day. And if you're unable to give your best or do your best, then it becomes a problem. Okay. Um. But I don't know if they've made the connect. I think they're starting to make the connection between why some people begin to suffer mentally. Your panic attack. I don't. Mm. I do believe I have not had a panic attack, but I certainly have experienced some sort of extreme anxiety type events that could be classified as a panic attack, but. Yeah, yeah, it certainly sounds very horrible. Did you have any more following that? And do you think COVID played a big part in just that general vibe that the whole world was really sort of quite stressed mentally? I think it probably did because I hadn't had one before. And yes. uh, I'd obviously felt anxious before in life, but I'd never had this extreme um racing heartbeat as if someone's just given you i imagine a big injection of adrenaline mm. and this ice cold 
grip on the back of your neck. Mm -hmm. So I definitely knew that it was a panic attack. Okay. And it was in a yeah public place. So after that, like I said, I went to the doctor and I started, he prescribed me some uh, medicine that would hopefully prevent it. And everything was going fine. I got both of my vaccinations and I thought, well, no, I don't really need to take these um, tablets anymore. Mm -hmm. So with the doctor's advice, I weaned myself off them. And then it wasn't long after um, the case, the next wave of Corona came here, which would be the Omicron wave. And mm -hmm. the numbers were getting really high and it was in the schools. So the students were starting to get sick. And I had realized that my it had been about six months, seven months since my second vaccine. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I needed a booster, but there was also a bit of a wait for that. So that's when the second panic attack came and it happened to come, you know, at a really bad time. Not that there's a good time to have one, but uh, I was in the classroom in the middle of a lesson and I was leading the lesson and uh, I felt, you know, the, the warning signs because I remembered them from the first time. I felt that icy cold water, you know, kind of running down the back of my neck and then the heart just starts, goes from zero to 100 and, you know, it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And then you think, oh, my God, you know, I'm in this classroom and all these students are looking at me. And I've still got to talk and function. And, you know, at the best of times, it's it can be a pretty nervous environment because the focus is all on you and you're the leader. And, you, you know, you can't really show weakness. Yeah. So I had to somehow deal with this panic attack. With, I didn't have any medic, medicine, medication. So I just started to walk around the room, you know, and uh, look at the students' work. Um, but the whole time, you know, I was inside. There was a hurricane. Mm. Uh, and I eventually, I was staring at the clock, waiting for the bell to ring, you know. And I think I'm right, there's 20 minutes left. Okay, there's 19 minutes left. Okay, Ooh. there's 18 and a half minutes left. And it was the yeah. most grueling end of a class that I've ever had. Wow. But after about 30 minutes or so, it went away. So as a result of that, I went back to the doctor to, and I said, look, I'm sorry, but I need uh, a bit of help again in terms of prescription medication yeah and uh he was a bit reluctant to do it but i think he saw you know my condition and that i, I did need it and it, i was also still waiting for the third the booster jab yeah so so far touch wood i've had two and mm. i've since had the third vaccination yeah. but i'm still taking the anti-anxiety medication hmm. so it's working for me at the moment but good yeah i think it was definitely covid related hmm. also the fact that i didn't really have a strong support network because i was away from home as in a different country a different language completely different environment and i realized that a lot of the scaffolding that everybody needs around them i didn't really have it i had a little bit of it so it didn't take much for uh for me to collapse yeah 
because I didn't have the support that we often take for granted. When you take that away, you're more, well, at least in my situation, I'm more vulnerable to anxiety and inevitably a panic attack. And I do remember my mother saying that she did suffer from them. And I was always, I had no idea what this was. I had no idea what she was on about. Yeah. But when you have one, uh, or if you've had a, suffered a panic attack, you know that you've had it because it's uh, unlike anything else, really. But looking at the positive side, I was able to learn from the first one. Mm -hmm. So I knew what was happening the second time around. And I knew that, look, this is going to go away. Just try and remember your breathing, walk around. Um, just try and get back some bit of control. You understand what's happening and you understand why. And it somehow makes it a bit more bearable. It's still horrible. Yeah. But uh, because, because you're not really so frightened as to what the hell is going on, mm. I think that's a big key to it, understanding, understanding what's happening to you mentally and why. Yeah. What are the triggers and yeah. what are the coping mechanisms that I can use? What are the tools that I can use? If I need a bit of help from the doctor, if I need some prescription medication, go for it. That's what I would say. Because nobody knows what's going on inside you, except for you. You're the only one that knows. You're the only. You're the one that's in the hurricane or in the middle of the storm. Yep. Um. So you have to tell somebody else. You have to tell somebody else. Look, this is what's happening, and I'm afraid. I don't understand why it's happening, and uh. You know what can you do to help? Because I need help. Yeah, I think that's when I realized I had to say to myself, "Look, I can't fix this by thinking my way out of it. Mm -hmm. I need some external tools to help me." Yeah, so I've learned a lot through the whole past couple of years of this of this shitty time. Yeah. I um have a vaguely similar experience. Um, it's something I've mentioned before, and I know I ran this past you recently, but maybe this would be a good time just to lay it out for everyone else to hear, just briefly. But um, just firstly on the idea of you know seeking external help. I mean, obviously that comes in two forms. You've got um talking. In all its various forms, which is basically, you know, what all psychotherapy is, which is mm. proves to be very, very useful for a lot of people. And then the other form is medication. Um, and I've done both myself. Um, but also just to your point about when you know what it is or when you don't know what it is, you know, mm. um, and when you like you, you described the first time the panic attack happened, you're like, you know, you couldn't describe it. You couldn't understand it. Um, but then afterwards you had, it had a name, if you will. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, my experience in January was something that I don't think I'll ever know what it was for certain mm. because it could have been something very similar, like a panic attack, anxiety attack. But the fact was it happened five days in a row um, right. for, for about two hours each time. Um, and l <clears throat> excuse me. Long story short, the alternative to the anxiety theory is this very peculiar thing I never heard of called serotonin syndrome, mm -hmm. um, which is basically something I didn't know existed, which is that you can actually have too much serotonin right which i thought was a bit unusual not unusual a bit odd because 
that's just something I've never heard in my life. It's like boost your serotonin, boost your serotonin, you know? Yeah, I thought um, it was a feel-good chemical, you know, happy days. Yeah, exactly right. So just stack it up. What could go wrong? Yeah. Um, so if that is what happened, that it was serotonin syndrome, it has a lot of the same kind of symptoms as bad anxiety. Um, yeah, it has a lot of the same symptoms as anxiety, like crazy fast heart rate, and, you know, just racing thoughts, you know, feeling mm. hot and cold and all that stuff. But the um, the one big difference, I think, I'm sure some people maybe get this is, but like physical, like shaking. So my whole right. body would, would shake as if I was cold, the way you probably are feeling right now. <laughs> Um, so your body was giving you the warning signs that, hey, something's up. Yeah. Like the nervous system was literally like stretched to its maximum. Mm. Um, and long story short on the serotonin syndrome, I just think this is something really, really important for people to know is if that is what it was, the reason probably that it was for me was that so I've been, I took, I started taking SSRIs a long time ago, probably about 2012. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've been weaning myself off them, especially over the last sort of year and a half. So I was down to just one a week, which the doctors told me is basically like, that's almost not doing anything for you, but mm -hmm. I'm aware that you don't just stop those things. That's a whole other discussion, but yeah, it goes badly yeah. if you just stop. But I'd say it would be enough to, um, yeah, still be making a big difference in the brain. Um, so anyway, I was about five days into this horrible scenario and someone mentioned my mum by chance because she knows I always like to try different supplements and different things, ironically, mm -hmm. to, you know, have a better quality of life. And she mentioned, yeah. had I been trying anything new? Uh, and what I had been trying was this one ashwagandha. Um, and if you read the literature, every medical journal will say it's fine. It's good. There's no complications. There's no worries about taking any other drugs. But the anecdotal stuff like on Reddit and so forth said a very mm. different story. And a lot of people right. were describing exactly what I had experienced. Um, so the lesson there is basically if you are on any of these um, medications for anxiety, depression, etc., just be extremely careful when you introduce anything else into your um, diet, I suppose, dietary supplements mm -hmm. and so forth. Because um, if it was serotonin syndrome, I mean, the worst case scenario on that is death. You know, it's, it's not a stretch to imagine that either, you know, because the body right. is clearly like absolutely freaking out. Um, but yeah, I just thought that it'd be a time to mention it. So just to round off the story for people listening, sorry to keep you sitting there in the cold, mate. I hope you're all right. No, I, um, um, I actually forgot that I have a, a piece of modern technology. Oh. And uh, it's a. Is that a heat pack it's thing? Called, it's a little heat pack, yeah. And oh, I've been sitting lovely. here like an idiot with it <laughs> in my bag. So, yeah, you just give it a little. You can actually stick it to your uh, clothes. Oh, wow. So, yeah, sorry. Oh, that's no. better. Oh, anyway, yeah. sorry, you were saying just to round off that. Yeah, experience. just to round it off. Um, so, um, yeah. So, obviously, when I realized what it was causing it, this was to your point as well, sorry. It then had a name, if you will. It had um, at least a hypothetical, hopeful reason for why I was feeling like I was feeling worse before. Mm. As you, as you described with your panic attack, when it just comes out of nowhere and you've never experienced it, which I've never experienced any anxiety in my life, it's the fact that you don't know what it is and you've no name yeah, for it that then makes part. it so much worse. Um, like, yeah, like petrol times, on the... Yeah, 
petrol on a fire it's like time slows yeah. down if you know like those two hour sessions of feeling crazy hot you know crazy bad they could have been two days you know what i mean because um that's just the way your mind's racing so fast um but yeah just to round it off sorry i finally get to the point so that one week that was it five days i believe it was maybe another little half an hour or two here and there the following week but um i think the following week then i had a bit of insomnia i ended up getting three hours sleep in three days so my body had obviously just went very strangely turned a right turn and, and went what on earth were you doing to me um yeah but weirdly i was i could cope with three hours sleep after three days i was getting up at 6 a.m and just going and doing things and walking the dog and yeah. um very strange but eventually um i got back to work and i went in and um i described what had happened to someone in work um and there was only about three people in the office at this point mm -hmm. but i just started crying out of nowhere it just mm -hmm. came out of me just i think just the reality of just how severe it had been and just how traumatic it had been um mm. but when i got back that day from the office then i slept that night you know that was the insomnia way it was almost like the thought of going back to work and back to normal life not that not work in particular but just the idea that i could get back to normal life by being around people was all yes. it took to to kind of break the curse if you will um and and that was it since then i've just been as you've mentioned coping mechanisms very mm. cognizant of of using them i like breathing exercises too like yourself um and mm. exercise that'd be my two and photography so mm. yeah that was it really it's uh it's terrifying when you're in the middle of it but uh, when it's over, that's when you get a bit of perspective and you can process, at least I could process what happened and maybe why, understand why it happened yeah. and therefore take steps to avoid it happening again, which is what you want to do. Yep, exactly. I think it's... um. Do you know one of the best parts of it for in my experience i don't know if you experienced this too but um like that there was two weeks that those two weeks in january end of january i was such a mess and i made such a fool what, what i would have considered a fool out of myself you know what i mean crying in the office in front of people things i would never dreamed would have happened in a thousand years and i sort mm. of said to myself well, well what happened when you did make a fool out of yourself and the answer was nothing. No one cares. No one cared. No. Well, they cared in, in the right way. You know what I mean? They cared mm -hmm. about my, my well-being. But no one no one cares. Everyone's got their shit. Everyone's got their yeah. burden. Um, and if anything, I think people were just like, well, yeah, of course this happens. You know, don't worry about it. Um, so ultimately, yeah, that the takeaway was, yeah, the, the worst thing that can happen is you're embarrassed for a minute. But then you realize you're still alive at least and yeah life life will just keep moving along and you got that release and you talked about it and you um you cried which is also can be a release uh, you know i don't know what happens in the brain whenever you you know you shed so many tears but like you said, you know, you probably slept a lot better after that. Yeah. So it was a good thing, you know, yeah. in hindsight. It was probably something that you were dreading, but you couldn't see the benefit until afterwards. Exactly. Like so many things, I suppose. It's taken that one step, that one scary step, um, and yeah, sometimes it does bite you in the ass. Like in that case, the bite was just crying in front of some people. But to to my ego and to my sense of whatever ego might be, that was horrible. That was terrible. That's the worst thing yes. ever. 
but You're then the fear was realized. Mm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead with your compliments, sir. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I was going to say, you know, you have to uphold this image of a young, strong, uh, masculine, uh, ha handsome. Was male. it? Sorry, you're going to say as well. Handsome. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, nice yeah. beard. Nice beard too. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Back at you. Yeah. You've got to maintain this yes. uh, image, and uh, you know, boys don't cry. You know, which That's is right. rubbish. Yep. So, I'd say it was horrendous to go through because mine, at least, was over relatively quickly. But to have it repeat for five days, and um maybe know that it was going to happen again but also not knowing why like you said or what it was yeah yeah it's the it's like the uh it's like the the beast in the dark room you know mm. it's like the um the original nightmare as a kid what's in the corner what's in the dark you can't see in the dark you know, that's what's scary. It's not the beast itself. You turn the light on, it's probably a fly. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's the unknown. Yeah. It, it's all the things that you worry it could be. That's right. Exactly. Um, but I think uh, somebody was talking about this, that that's a completely normal way of thinking because that's how we survived as a species you know if you were slightly afraid of what was in the dark cave mm -hmm. then you didn't go in there yeah. whereas somebody that went in there and had zero fear zero anxiety they went in there and maybe they were eaten by a lion or a bear so <laughs> they weren't able to pass on their uh that characteristic to the next generation yeah so you know there's an argument for being paranoid and being anxious has has kept us alive as a as a species except now the things that cause anxiety aren't you know dark caves or what's under a rock it's uh am i making my boss happy am i earning enough money am i achieving my goals they're yeah. the things that cause anxiety now it's not the it's not uh it's not the same triggers but it's the same effect totally is my yeah. um is my car impressing my neighbors that kind of thing exactly i'm getting anxiety because you know i've had so many likes or dislikes on this whatever social media yeah, right post comment you know it's causing you this same level of anxiety as you know walking into a a dark cave but, yeah uh, but the reason um the reason i i wanted to tell people that story about what happened to me in january was ultimately because a it's a huge reason why i started doing this podcast in the first place mm -hmm. Um, and B, yeah, it's sort of also one of the core tenets of, of doing it, which is like to try and be as honest as possible, you know, and, um, for me, the only way to do that is to, to try and, um, be a bit vulnerable yourself, you know, uh, it was, goes back to what you said. It's, it's not what we're taught. Um, it's not what guys are supposed to do, but ultimately, like I say, I had that experience and I didn't die. So I thought if anyone can get any kind of benefit from any of these conversations, hearing people like you, Aaron, talking about your experiences, then if one person can take a nugget of information and, and not arrive at some of the places maybe that we have, then that's yeah. a, a success. Absolutely, because you're taking a negative experience uh, and using it to uh, hopefully help other people. Yeah. 
I hope so. Eventually, at least. Mm. Will we um? Will we wrap this up? I think we've been going quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'm, yeah, I'm not kind of jittering because of the cold, but I'm, it's because my bladder, <laughs> my bladder is the size of a of a grapefruit. No, yeah. you know, <laughs> no, mate. I get it. Here, listen. It's it's um yeah. I think this has been brilliant, honestly. So um, I just don't want to stop because it's really good. But it's it's also two a.m. here, so I should probably um. Ah, me, I. I should probably wrap yeah, up. Yeah, it's uh for the record, it's ten fifty six a.m. Oh, okay, but yes, I don't um, want you to um I don't want you to have to piss yourself. Do you wanna? Do you have anything else you want to say, or anything you would want to leave with people? Um, Any nuggets about anything, frankly? I suppose I would say just. I think the last word that you mentioned was death, and um, the way I look at it is, it's. Uh, and you also talked about, you know, something in the dark. That, that scary thing in the dark is that um, if you're feeling like the only way out is uh, to end your life you know I've been through uh, some tough situations you know losing both of my parents and having to watch my mother wither away is that uh, it reminds you that um, it will come eventually for you. You know, Mother Nature will, uh, there's no escape, basically. So I kind of I kind of look at it like you're every day, every day it gets a bit closer. So, and every day you're somewhat being pursued by it. So why make it easy? Why make it easier? for mother nature or whoever that um whatever figure you want to represent uh, death to be is that uh it is inevitable so why why give in why give up before that time comes mm. um yeah that's the way i think about it you know I've, never really considered ending my life because of that reason is because I think a because my father died when he was so young and part of that is thinking oh you know every day is a bonus I know it's a cliche but it really it's a, it's a useful way to look at it yeah and that don't don't give in don't give up don't lie down and just make it easy for the Grim Reaper to come because uh, it will come one day. <laughs> so not to not to get too dark or too down about it, but um, if there's anybody out there thinking about there's no other way out, mm. you know, um, I would say just hang in there and hang on because if you can have one uh, nice moment in a day that for me at least makes the day worth living for um, yep. even if it's just a a nice walk or a connection with another person you haven't seen or if it's an encounter uh, with an animal um, yep. And there's definitely so much to stick around for. I totally agree. I also would just add to that that you, you've no idea how immeasurably valuable you are to other people. People you mightn't even realize value you, you know. So it's important mm -hmm. to remember that too. That's right. I would worry about, you know, the people that that you would leave behind. Yeah. And the effect, you know, you would be, your problems would have gone away because you, you wouldn't exist anymore. But the people that loved you, um, would have to go on with the loss, and That's they right. would have to cope with the grief. So, 
That's again, um, I heard Jordan Peterson say this before to someone asked him that question roughly. What would you say to someone who's just given up on suicide as their next option? And he said, mm-hmm. put it off. It's like you can always put it off, you know, till tomorrow mm-hmm. and then tomorrow, make it tomorrow and just keep doing that. I um, go to, uh, I have to visit another school sometimes and uh, it was getting very quiet. So I didn't really, I could have stayed at my normal school, but I decided to go to the visiting school and Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a young Japanese woman run along the hallway with a brush and there was a bird that was trapped it kept flying into the window and if you've ever witnessed that it's pretty you know unsettling yeah and i don't know what she was going to try and accomplish with this broom because the bird was just flying away from her eventually quietly approached the bird and um it was on the ground you know after hitting the window and i managed to pick it up open the window and put it outside and it quickly just jumped down onto the ground <laughs> and the the feeling that you get from that is just it's just so good it's pure joy because you've uh, you don't know what would have happened to that animal if I hadn't have gone to that school that day what yeah. would have, you know, would have eventually broken its neck by flying into the window or what would have happened? And... Yeah. Such a simple action it as was. well that made you feel it so was, good. So simple, but the joy that you that I got from it was uh, just can't top it. You cannot top it. Yeah. So. Brilliant. Well, that's a yeah. lovely place to end, mate, I think. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully I've uh, made some sense when I've been talking about sitting here at this um, ancient shrine, you know, in my camping chair. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's um, a beautiful touch. I just, yeah, reiterate if you're listening to this. Well, let's see how the GoPro footage turns out. <laughs> yeah, but turn on, <laughs> is it on? on the GoPro? But um, yeah, <laughs> definitely get on YouTube and at least have a wee glance at this because um, even your Zoom camera at the moment is just lovely. Um, so yes, Aaron, thank you very, very much. I really, really do appreciate your time, um, and it's great to talk to you. Thank you, Tim, and uh, right back at you and. Uh... Thanks very much for giving me the time and for starting the podcast. I think it's going to help everybody that watches it and listens to it. So bravo. And uh, it's all to your credit. So, yeah, thank you, Tim. Well, that's very nice of you to say. And uh, away to your bed because it's, I don't even know what time it is there now. <laughs> it's, five, it's five past 11 a.m. here. This is my rock and roll lifestyle, mate. It's 2, <laughs> 2 a.m. on a Saturday night, and what am I doing? I'm talking to my friend in Japan on Zoom who's sitting at a, at a shrine in his camping chair. <laughs> yeah. Mate, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it. See him, great. see him. Yeah, it's good. Um, and just to remind people, relaxing videos from Japan, right, on YouTube. Yes, and if you go, have Go Instagram. subscribe to that, please people because um it's really really beautiful stuff it really is thanks very much and uh, another shameless plug instagram aaron.211 aaron.211 instagram yeah and what do we find on there is it by chance lots of cool photos from japan uh i hope you feel that way yeah yeah it's all photography uh from japan it's not there's not a single selfie (laughs) <laughs> to be I'll have to go and double check thank that god for that um... <laughs> see, see if I find one I'm telling you <laughs> alright mate no, you're, you're, you're a legend 
you are. And I'd, I'd like to do this again sometime in the future. Absolutely. Uh, when it's a little bit warmer here, I can take you to another exotic destination. And, oh, uh, that'd be cool. We can talk, we can argue about how much better cats are than dogs. <laughs> It wouldn't be much of an <laughs> argument now, would it? <laughs> <laughs> well, All right. We'll see. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. All right, buddy. Um, thanks once more, and I'll speak to you later. Thank you, Tim. All the best. Sleep well. All and best, uh, I'm in tomorrow, so I can tell you that it's going to be a good day. You're in tomorrow. Oh, oh, good, good. Yes, it's useful to have someone in the future. Like, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Time zones are weird, aren't they? They, Oof, are. they really are. <laughs> awesome, mate. All right, all the best. Okay, you too, Tim. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye. Very cool. So, are you gonna are you gonna show us this shrine a little bit? Yeah, I'll. Uh, what I'll turn a the camera uh, on. what a privilege. What a lovely little bonus. Yeah, that'd be awesome. You're welcome. Just hope the internet still works. So uh, you pass through uh, the Tory gate of, of uh, all the Shinto shrines, and uh, there'll be the, a little introduction of when the shrine when the shrine was created, etc. And then you'll start the pathway to enlightenment. I suppose you could call it. Mm -hmm. You can only use one of those. The, this is when the mask comes off and yes. the hat comes off. <laughs> um, That's just a beautiful, beautiful surroundings, beautiful trees. So uh, serene, would you say? It is, and it's just that color green, you know. Yeah. And nobody does, nobody does moss like Japan. Look at that! That's neon it's, green, uh, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, you just you can already feel uh, the spirituality, even though I'm don't consider myself a religious person, but I know what you mean. You to, yeah. Place like this, I'm already out of breath, mate. <laughs> Do you know? I noticed those steps are very shallow. They seem unnecessarily yeah. shallow. Like they could just double or triple. I know you're making me feel even more <laughs> unfit. <laughs> but you're doing more work. You know, your feet are doing more steps than they need to. That's a, that's, a, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got your back, mate. Don't yeah. worry. <sighs> and what is this fun little flag here? I see on the right. I think this one says uh your da sells avon <laughs> I, think, I think that's what that one is they do avon in uh in japan yeah <laughs> <laughs> they've got everything everything but uh that i think that's the name of the shrine that's the name of the shrine but they don't usually have the flags up yeah so the busiest time of year is New Year's. Everybody will go to their local shrine yeah, and kind of try and see in the new year in a, in a positive way. Yes. They're very much into, from what I understand, I'm quite a big fan. Uh, we were to go, I think I told you this recently, we were to go this summer, but unfortunately had to postpone because we couldn't actually book anything at the time. But I've been yeah. doing a lot of research, and yeah, I understand they're very much into sort of luck and you know wishing, wishing good luck and bringing good luck to themselves and their family in the Japanese culture through you know places like this. Is that accurate? I definitely, I definitely, you're spot on. There's always a little place to wash your hands. Oh, that's lovely. And you go there, so there'll be a cup. And there's a certain way to wash your hands and clean the cup all in one go. I don't know how often they change that tile, but it looks pretty good. <laughs> it does look good. They must have <laughs> used uh, Daz, I think, on that one. <laughs> so, 
So here's one of the the bells that they'll ring during the ceremony. It makes a very distinct sound that you can hear. Is that one? Did I see like like a? Is it like a bamboo that you, you crash into it? Is that how that works? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone will stand here and pull that back, and it'll give that a whack. Beautiful, such a um, such a sense of occasion to everything. I feel in these places, there is. They really could go in for the detail, even you know these little things. I don't know the purpose, whether there's something written on the paper or yeah. or not, but they're wrapped around all four supports and then even along the top oh yeah um this is this is i have to say this um this is going to be a bummer for people on spotify so you're going to have to go on youtube to watch this because it's it's very worth seeing oh is it oh the format is different on spotify yeah they're um they're not doing video just yet well they are doing video but you have to be at a certain level and obviously I'm not at that level yet. Um, you'll get there, Timothy. So this is where people will come and they'll uh, make a little quiet prayer and they'll shake this and they'll rattle the bell and then they'll, if they want to make a donation, they can do it there. Okay. And I see the caretakers here today. His little car. You can just see through there. So, um, yeah. Well, I've got a. Uh, chair down here that I'll just sit myself into and try and recover from uh, <laughs> the pathway of enlightenment. Yes. Those shallow, shallow <clears throat> steps. Feel feel yeah. bad for you having to do all that work. Okay, so I'll be setting this down briefly. No problem. You do your thing. Kaput. Watch the full video podcast on YouTube at Kaput Network.